Sirish, come forward. <laughs> you can also come on the front row because we have limited audience and even the panelists are not there. Dr. Pandav is... is <laughs> Dr. Pandav is going to join us uh, in a short while. Dr. Satyan is likely to join immediately. And Dr. Krishna Das and Dr. Cyrus Mehta, uh, they have gone back for some emergency work uh, in their family. So by the meantime, Dr. Pandav is supposed to moderate this session. By the meantime, he comes and uh, takes over. Uh, let's start with a very, very simple and very common scenario which uh, uh, very often with these, uh, this particular question we face from our colleagues that what to do. I am presenting a case scenario. Uh, that's a real case, uh, a 40 years female, young female. I have followed her up for almost 12 years now. When she came to me for the first time, she gave a history of losing the vision in the right eye since early childhood because of the trauma. She was one-eyed and she was having a refractive error of around 3.5 diopter spherical in the left eye. There was a strong family history of glaucoma. Her mother was my Satyan. Please come on the dais. Satyan, 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 be there. <laughs> I hope you don't have the glaucoma. <laughs> Dark adaptation is poor. Dark adaptation is poor. <laughs> so Dr. Pandav is, is coming shortly, so he will take over. By the meantime, I am just presenting a very, very simple case scenario. So uh, the point to be noted is a young lady, one-eyed, strong family history of glaucoma and myope. Okay. Let's move to another slide. On the first time, we recorded the intraocular pressure in her left eye, sorry for this mistake. It's a 22 millimeter of mercury. Her central corneal thickness was 496 micron. The gonioscopy was open angle. Obviously, we wanted to do the baseline fields, OCT, and the disc photograph. And that is what you are seeing over here, the standard automated perimetry. That's a white on white perimetry is normal. While on the OCT, there was at 7 o'clock hours, you can see that there was a slight deviation. And you can see that the deviation plot, there was a significant area of the RNFL defect, which otherwise on clinical examination, we were not able to visualize. The CD ratio was around 0.6 and the neuroretinal rim was intact. So my question, not to the panelists right now, to the audience, that what would you like to treat? How many of you would you feel that she needs a treatment? None. So why you may think of treating her is, number one, is a young age. She has a very long life ahead. Number two, she is one-eyed. Number three, there is a strong family history of glaucoma. And number four, there is an important Another important risk factor, that's a moderate myopia. So for these reasons, the patient may be taken up for the treatment or you may consider treating her. But would you like to treat her just on the basis of OCT image? Because the standard automatic perimetry is normal. The intraocular pressure recorded is 22 millimeter of mercury. So obviously just on the basis of OCT 
we do not like to treat the patient as on today because the standard definition of glaucoma is a characteristic changes in the optic nerve head with RNFL defect and correlating visual field changes. You have to have the holistic approach for diagnosing the glaucoma and treating the glaucoma. So obviously the OCT or the imaging technology does not fall into that. Clinically there was no significant RNFL defect though it was picked up on the OCT. Now two years later you see that the perimetry remains normal but there was a significant enlargement of the inferior RNFL defect and this deviation of RNFL thinning has gone down from 2 micron to 8 micron. So in two years time if the RNFL thinning at the same location because the OCT has a great registration capability at the same location by multiple repetition if you feel that the thinning has gone down almost the double of the standard deviation that makes a strong case that the patient is progressing and the most reliable is the deviation map in the OCT. You can see that this was the changes earlier and this was the changes later. So a strong family history of glaucoma, one-eyed lady, young, moderate myopia and there is uh, documented changes on the OCT. So yes, what would you like to do? Would you like to treat her now? Yes, so at least a couple of people. Yes, Satyan, we need your opinion now. Yeah. <coughs> uh, what about the other eye, right eye? It's a blind eye. Uh, no, she sustained an injury in the early childhood. Early, okay. Now, uh, I just forgot the and age. And her, her, her mother was my patient okay. and she had a very advanced glaucoma. Okay. So, a strong family history of glaucoma. How old is she now? 40 years. 40? 40, yeah. 40. The only thing is what I can think of is the IOP is 22 and the corneal thickness in this patient is 496. So approximately we can possibly add about another uh, 2 millimeters to 2.5. Every 50 microns we add 2 to 2.5. So it's still on the higher side that is like a 23 or 24 we can say the IOP values. But one uh, hitch for me is uh, just uh, seeing the OCT though there is a progression which is seen again on the follow-up but what we need is the fundus photograph to really see whether the patient had uh, any inferior or nephil thinning. No, yeah, it was, uh, I, I could not put it because, you know, I made this but <laughs> case the, the in the morning itself. The simple reason is... Uh, so, obviously, there was no obvious RNFL thinning on clinical examination. Anything uh, in the OCT or anything in the visual fields, uh, we may not be able to really come to some conclusion saying that there is a strong uh, evidence to treat. But IOP, family history, these are the two things. But a fundus examination, if it is kind of a correlating with the OCT, then obviously th there is a way that we have to go for the treatment definitely in this uh, patient. Yeah, so I agree with Dr. Satyan, uh, most of the things. And uh, we decided to treat this patient because uh, uh, that was just a one recording on diurnal variation. Her pressure went up to 24 millimeter of mercury. That was the highest during the daytime. During the daytime, that was the highest pressure recorded. And uh, as I said, that young lady with a strong family history of glaucoma and there is a progression on the OCT. So just on the basis of this, or to be on the safer side, we decided to treat that patient medically and what she about was the put on the beta blocker. Yeah. I have done the follow-up of around 10 years for this lady now and she hasn't progressed but still she is on the Timolos drop. Uh, what about the systemic uh, illnesses? There is there is no, I did mention that there is no systemic no condition systemic uh, noted okay. and the gonioscopy was normal. Okay. Can I request uh, Dr. Pandav to come on the dais and take the charge? Uh, so we have addressed almost all these questions. Uh, by the meantime, uh, 
just I will take you to another similar kind of a situation. Uh, it's a 45 years gentleman, uh, a IA, IPS officer, was under my care for almost seven years from now. And uh, he was diagnosed to have a glaucoma elsewhere and was put on the PG analog. There was no family history of glaucoma, no systemic disease. Intraocular pressure with the medication was around 17 millimeter of mercury and the CCT was around 524 micron. Gonioscopy was open angle and that was the disc appearance. Obviously, it's a tilted disc with the inferior conus. So there is an oblique insertion of the scleral canal to the globe. And obviously, this visual field changes are correlating with the inferior conus that you can expect in a normal individual. And the OCT also, the changes are correlating. I have put off the patient from the medication. The patient is without medication. The intraocular pressure is ranging between 20 to 22. On this much of follow-up, he has not progressed. So you have to be very careful while you are examining the disc and you must consider the congenital anomalies. So thank you. Satin, would you like to comment on something? Yes. I think this is a very, very good case. Can, can you go back to the tilted disc thing? Uh, keep on the same presentation, please. I think just keep the same presentation for a couple of minutes. The same case, the previous one. Can we have at least one light on in the audience? It's absolutely dark. Yes. <laughs> it is either too dark or it's, you know, in, in, it's too bright. So uh, this is yeah, so the this disc optic is actually, nerve. I think we want you to uh, kind of have a look at this optic nerve uh, because this is how the tilted disc, uh, yeah, this is how the tilted disc they look. I think this is a very typical. And uh, you can see here that disc is tilted vertically. And what is a tilted disc? How does it happen? Can anyone, anyone can say in the audience? Do you have any idea of what the tilted disc is? Why the disc is tilted? That is, I just told you about that. There is an oblique insertion of the scleral canal over the globe. Because these discs are sometimes they are mistaken for glaucoma, even if they are normal. But that doesn't mean that tilted disc cannot have glaucoma. So I think. Uh, uh, they, you need a very careful examination uh, in these uh, these situations, and because they, they could be very confusing at times. Now, tilted disc is basically, you know, normally what happens is that you you have the eyeball, which is a sphere, right, anterior posterior axis, visual axis, and the optic nerve comes a little from the nasal side. Okay, so it's not attached squarely at the back of the eye; it's actually a little on the side. So there's a little obliquity to the to the insertion. Now, if the disc is squarely attached to the optic to the globe then the, how would the uh, the disc appear so then the disc would be like a round structure and it would have a neurodactyl which is equal on the all the side because all the structures are symmetrical but here because the obliquity the temporal side is a little sloping than the nasal side so the temporal side gives you a little more reflection from the underlying sclera and the and the, the lamina cribrosa so that appears a little a little lighter in color and the nasal side which is you know more angled that appears a little darker because there's a more tissue under that so that's why you get the normal color of the disc but in a tilted disc you know that normal anatomy is not there now in this case the dil this is a vertical now what's happening here how the how do you think the nerve is attached to the the globe here the nerve is actually coming from a bit superiorly you know and is you know attached a little you know the, the obliquity is like is superior to inferior. So the upper end becomes a little more prominent and there's a slope and the, the conus which is in the inferior. So if you understand that anatomy of the whole thing, then it becomes much easier to kind of identify the disc. And then of course you look at the neurodegenerative rim and look at how much is the conus and then you, uh, like beautifully Dr. You know, uh, Dr. Prateep has shown you how the visual field defects actually corresponding to this, uh, which may not be glaucomatous. So sometimes all you need to do is to monitor, understand basically the pathology, why something is happening. So that understanding is more important. And once you know that, you're more confident in you know, dealing with that case. 
So yeah, the vertical follow-up is very important. And if the patient is not progressing, then obviously the patient does not have a glaucoma. But because the patient is apprehensive, you have to investigate and you have to keep that patient under observation. Thank you. Now the Dr. Panda will take over. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patil. And I apologize for being late because I had a little uh, uh, talk in another session, so I had to kind of rush from there. Uh, can we go back to the next presentation? So I'll, we'll just take you through a few cases. Uh, cases are basically just to stimulate or kind of give you some some kind of a background to talk about. But feel free to uh, you know ask or interrupt any time. Uh, there's no time limit. We'll go through cases and whatever the time permits us, how much time we have. So if you want to discuss one case for 20 minutes, there's no problem. And if you want to you know discuss 10 cases, 20 minutes, there's no problem. The only thing is that the more you discuss, the better it would be. Uh, so if you have any any question you know, related to anything, just feel, feel free to ask that. Okay, so I'll go to the case. I think you had discussed two cases already. Yeah, so, so, so my assumption was correct that probably I'll start at number three. So we'll get, go to the case three, okay? So this is the history. There's a 57 years old female patient, a complaint of decrease in vision photophobia in the left eye uh, for about a month. And uh, there was associated pain, ocular pain, there's no trauma surgery, no double vision, no nausea, vomiting, no glaucoma in the family, and she is diabetic for 12 years, well controlled. So what is your, what comes to your mind now here? Quick, quick answers please. Say something. Otherwise I feel, you know, I'm just talking to nobody. Anything? Yes, so okay, that's fantastic. Because there's a history su suggestive, you know, you know, something is happening in the eye. Uh, so there's a symptomatic, you know, all glaucoma patients are not symptomatic. So this patient is a bit symptomatic. And uh, if you look at the open angle glaucoma, they are absolutely asymptomatic. And if you look at the angle closure disease, they are also 90% they are asymptomatic. So they're very small percentage of cases of angle closure, they would have any <coughs> symptoms. So this is the further, if you look at the visual acuity, it's, it's 6, 9, 6, 18, so left eye is a little low. Um, uh, and uh, other things are basically normal. Uh, there's no RAPD, the people looks good, but I'll show you the pictures. I think I have the photographs. So what do you think about these pictures now? Do you find anything unusual? Come forward, you are, you're, very f you're sitting very far back, so probably I'm not able to communicate. Fantastic. So I think if you look carefully, there's a difference in the two. The, the, the people on the right, left side is a bit smaller and then the right side, even though it's reacting, it's a no RAPD was mentioned in the history, but you can see there's a little difference in the two people, pupils and also uh, slight irregularity of the pupil on the, I think on the nasal on the nasal side, so there's a very mild irregularity. So that kind of also gives you some clues, that, okay, left eye, uh, something is happening. So a careful examination is uh, very important. Now, what do you see here? There's another finding here. Fantastic, so glaucon flacons. So you, can you see that opacity in the lens there? Now switch off the lights for a minute, please. Okay, now you can see it better, right? Okay, so there's a little bit of lenticular opacity where the pupillary margin would have been at that time. Uh, so that's a glucon flacon. Uh, light on, please. So you have, you know, very subtle signs. There is some symptoms, not very marked, but there is some subtle symptoms. There's a little subtle change in the iris and in the lens, and that actually leads you to the diagnosis. So it's very careful. It's, it's a good clinical exam. Anterior secondary exam is actually very useful, and it gives you a lot of clues as to what might be happening. This is, what test is this? This is Venerix. So you can see the AC, the peripheral AC is quite shallow. And this is the other eye, which is again, shows a shallow anterior chamber. And this is the gonioscopy. What do you think there is in the gonioscopy? Anyone? Please, come on. <laughs> uh, you, you can't see, actually, you don't see any angle there. Can you switch off the lights, please? I think I wish there was a way uh, to better manage these lights. Uh, this nothing is visible actually. I think this eye to contact and nothing is visible. You might see a little bit of synechia there. 
uh, nasal tempo appears to be a little better, but I think the sphere angle particularly, sphere angle is more important for angle closure. Uh, you can see there's a bit of hump touching, the, maybe there's an underlying uh, synechia is already there. So the gonioscopy again is suggestive of angle closure. And this is on indentation. So if you do indentation, you press and look at the sphere angle which was totally closed earlier, uh, shows some opening and you can see there's a pigmentation uh, in the tabular meshwork area which is a kind of irregular pigmentation, splotchy kind of pigmentation is there and maybe there is some suggestion of a synechia there. So what does that mean? So this is the other angles. Uh, I think similarly you could open them a little bit and this is the other eye which again could be opened up on uh, indentations. So uh, what about this disc? This is the right eye, the disc picture and the red free. So this looks, looks pretty good to me. Uh, you know, maybe, do, do, you, do you think it's a mild pallor? Uh, again, commenting on pallor for the photograph sometimes could be a little difficult because the color value of the photograph may not be exactly the same. But if I have to say something about the disc, maybe slight temporal pallor here, uh, plus minus, but otherwise the disc looks okay to me. And uh, uh, how about this? This is left eye. And the same, but the chances are uh, as a little more marked, and you, you can see there's a bit of suspicious area here. Now the disc is a little on the smaller side, so the smaller disc they may not cup be, or the cup may not be become a, be very easily visible. And also, when the disc cup is shallow, it's very hard to define where the margin is or where the neural trim begins and ends. So this is one of those discs. So I would say that this is there's a kind of a suspicion on this, there's maybe there's a, you know, there is some, some loss of tissue might be there, okay? So I would put this disc in a kind of that category and then go further. So what is the clinical diagnosis? So clinical diagnosis is kind of intermittent or subacute angle closures and the right eye is uh, suspect because right eye angles are occludable but there's no, um, there's no evidence actually that there's synechia or anything but the left eye definitely is a primary angle closure if not glaucoma because we don't have visual field. Can we have the lights on please? So if we don't have the visual field so uh, we have a suspected disc changes but no visual field defect we haven't demonstrated yet so you can't really call it glaucoma at this stage but definitely uh, if you go by the history and if you go by the clinical picture so far there's an evidence that angle is closing in the left eye. So left eye is the primary angle closure if not glaucoma at this stage. So do you agree with that? So, any, any <laughs> so obviously the right, right eye is a primary angle closure suspect and the left eye is a acute angle closure or maybe an intermittent angle closure. But glaucoma are not that we would be able to say only when we have a perimetry. But while looking at the disc, it looks like a, uh, there might be some field defect because there is always a difference between the optic nerve head changes in the primary open angle glaucoma and the angle closure glaucoma. The angle closure glaucoma, where you have a acute elevation in the IOP, they show more of a pelar than the cupping. And that is what exactly uh, imminent over here. So uh, in my opinion, yes, uh, the left eye has a angle closer, chronic angle closer glaucoma probably. Yeah, so we right did some of the tests then, yeah. So huh? obviously we'll do some investigations for this. Uh, uh, yeah. Obviously the first thing which we would like to do is the YAG laser peripheral iridotomy for both the eyes, the right eye as well as the left eye. The left eye is not the RAPD, it's a sphincter atrophy and that's why the pupil is slightly vertically dilated. And you have most of the evidences which suggest the angle closure, acute angle closure attack. That includes the iris atrophy, that includes the pigmentation on the posterior surface of the cornea which was not visible. You have the glaucoma flecans. So everything suggests that the patient have had the acute attack in the left eye. So we had uh, visual fields and which was uh, kind of a not very typical for glaucoma, the left eye, uh, left eye is kind of a, it's not really showing much in some specs here which goes with the superior uh, suspected margin but not really to define as a scotoma. The other eye is so similar which the optic nerve is actually much better. So probably we can say that the 
the nerve is, uh, the visual field is still normal. But again, as Dr. Pratip said, uh, it takes a little while. The, n the visual field effects appear a bit later. So that's the reason that we put in the angle closure uh, uh, category, uh, intermittent angle closure category, and the nerve fiber layer is again basically uh, supporting what we are uh, doing. So we also looked at the uh, the other matrix of this eye, and y you can see the lens thickness is, lens is kind of a normal uh, thickness up to four is is okay. Most of the lenses would be around, you know, that uh, chamber depth is definitely on the lower side. Normally it would be 3.5, but that is 2 point. So it's in a shallow AC. The exit length is s short, uh, so that again is uh, kind of corroborates uh, what we are seeing. So the management would be laser iodotomy, right? So I think Dr. Pratib already said that he would do laser iodotomy. Now the question here is one can also argue, do you do laser iodotomy before these investigations or I mean you do it straight away or do you really need to investigate you know, before you do laser iodotomy? So Satyan, what would be your approach? No, I just wanted to uh, go back to a little uh, the classification of the angle closure in this particular uh, scenarios because we had a, a primary angle closure suspect, then angle closure, then glaucoma, primary angle closure glaucoma, but the world classification suits well for this particular patient because there was an acute uh, attack or probably will classify that as an intermittent angle closure glaucoma. So that goes very well with this uh, uh, patient. Uh, but uh, doing the investigations, especially the, uh, the biometric values, uh, as of now it gives some more significance because the lens thickness also plays a critical role in uh, the angle closure disease. So when the lens thickness is uh, probably around 4.5 plus, uh, even if you do the PI, it is okay, there's nothing wrong. Most of the cases we have to go for the PI. But the lens removal is going to be one of the main uh, treatment aspects that we have to look for once the lens thickness is around uh, 4.5 plus. So that's where the biometric values also carries uh, an importance. That's what I was trying to come to. So I, I think, uh, I mean, this, in, in this case, the clinically speaking, I mean, if you don't go by, even if you don't, if you have no investigations, uh, if you have a, you know, good clinical examination and gonioscopy, practically you you have the diagnosis. Uh, you know, you you could safely call it an, you know, primary angle closure glaucoma or intermittent angle closure, and if that is happening, you know what to do. You know, the therapy would be a definitive therapy would be laser iodotomy to begin with, and then of course you. You, you know, you'll do those investigations and follow up these patients, you know, like any other glaucoma patients do. So the point here is that uh, you could manage this case, case very easily the, if you have access to a laser iodotomy. And other, I, I assume that you have access to certain gonioscopy and, you know, those are the, the normal things. So all, and the only thing you need here to benefit this patient is basically laser iodotomy. Yeah, just, just to add on to that, uh, uh, everybody feels uh, I have a very less number of patients for angle closure disease, but uh, like if you see the prevalence of angle closure disease in, I mean, India, it is definitely almost equivalent to the primary open angle glaucoma because we don't do the gonioscopy, we are not diagnosed ang angle closure. The way I am saying this particular issue is we don't want to buy the YAG laser machine. That is the uh, scenario. That's the reason why I am coming to that. So once you don't have the YAG laser machine, there are two things that one can think of. One is there are companies which are willing to give the rental for uh, the laser machines. The other option is if you don't want to refer, you don't want to take the rental, or you don't want to buy, then you can still do a surgical uh, peripheral diadectomy. It's not that uh, completely it is obsolete, but ideally is to go for the ARC PI, very simple. But I'm just coming to the other uh, practical uh, yeah, yeah, scenarios. Sure. I, I think that's the idea of these cases, actually, yeah. because the cases, they, they bring out, you know, the smaller and smaller issues. Is that you don't want uh, to refer, then you want to manage yeah, yeah, it, then these are the other options you have. You have. Options. And before that, I would say, I mean, while the patient is waiting for any of these, uh, do put this patient on a pilocopy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sir, uh, this is the thing which I wanted to point out. It seems that we have forgotten the drug pilocar. The trade people are also not marketing it. It is not available. And it, uh, uh, it is available, it is available. Very, very rare. No, it is available, very sir. Difficult very difficult to... No, you out. ask the... We d it, you no, just ask the RO lab. FDC, FDC, I mean this. FDC, FDC also has, 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 definitely so it is there. it will be there in the market because RO lab is making it, so Achha. it will be there. But having said that Pilacar in uh, angle closure, 
we have to be just careful without doing a peripheral hydrotomy there is no point in just giving a pilocard no 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 what i was telling yeah. first first thing which he told that what is the significance of doing the investigation before one should one can directly go for the pi but it is always better to document your case and uh, mostly the uh, angle closure glaucomas are mixed glaucomas and they are associated with some kind of uh, disc changes and other things so it is always better to go for the investigations uh, of course we cannot dilate the people but the other things in undilated state we can have visual field we can have our rnf analysis we can have cct etc yeah yeah definitely i mean if the investigations are available in house i think there's no point yeah. that's that's what we did yeah. but if you had to wait for an investigation to send somewhere else and I think uh, you initiate the therapy the before you wait for yeah, the investigation the point the thing is that everybody may not be having an yag laser uh, sure. facility but in that case we can uh, prescribe pilocar and it is not that a phobia is created in your mind that if you uh, prescribe pilocar uh, you will have difficulties in cataract surgery of course it is there but it is in cases of long term use 1 2 3 4 days 5 days just one just week we yeah. can we can wait and we can safely prescribe the patient yeah. till the patient reaches to a center where the center is having uh, yag laser facility True. yeah uh, but uh, i think uh, uh, there is a, a little uh, difference if you don't have a machine it is not that you just put the patient on pilocar to manage the angle closure disease because there are no other no, it is not the man yeah. it is not the first uh, line treatment what i am saying you can procure time you can purchase time till the patient reaches to a center where the patient is uh, where can be treated by yak pi if if the iops are really high then possibly yeah, you have to bring down through yeah. manitol so i think what only precaution is that sometime the iop can go up pilocarpine and is it possible to identify those patients who will have problem with pilocarpine but <laughs> everybody doesn't have you know yeah. all yeah. patient won't have problem with pilocarpine most of them will actually be benefited benefited but the only issue is when you are using i am not talking about the short term use of pilocarpine but when you are using the pilocarpine for a longer duration of time those patients who have a, even a open angles not very open but uh, like grade 2 can go in for a completely synecal closures because the, there is going to be a increase in the lens thickness when you use the pilocarpine so they develop a something called as a creeping angle closure yeah, glaucoma yeah, which we used to see very common yes we have so it is not that pilocarpine uh, uh, is just too safe but there is an issue with the pilocarpine also so we have to be keep bit careful Locked but once you have done the pi then the things are much more uh, easier so that is the one which i wanted to tell the, the second part is not all uh, uh, open angles are not all uh, normal chamber depth is open angles so in that case what is your option maybe angle appears to be closed but the chamber appears to be deeper so we are not looking at a scenario where there is going to be a, a pupillary block glaucoma in this so what is your uh, take home message for the audience in that uh, i think w what what you were saying normal anterior chamber you, depth you're saying is that, that you know normal when we talk, yeah, with when we angle, talk closure. angle closure glaucoma we are generally we are talking the pupillary bl block mechanism that's the pre predominant mechanism yeah. and that is what is actually benefited most with laser hydrotomy but there would be non pupillary block mechanisms also that that's what i'm yeah, coming so to. i think uh, the platyviris is is probably what you are kind of uh, referring to so there that is central ac is not that shallow uh, it you know it may be on the shallower side but you know it could be normal but the periphery is still uh, crowded the angle is still crowded because of this kind of the, they're pushing the iris anteriorly so there is more of a non pupillary block mechanisms so there the approach would be different so uh, and what do you do for this case someone what is your uh, do, do you do laser hydrotomy there or you do laser iroplasty i mean how do you approach no, this no, the, the, the first 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 learn the thumb rule whenever you have a patient with a high intraocular pressure then you have to put the gonioscope as well in each and every patient because you know sometime you may find some surprises like the angle recession excessive pigmentation pseudo exfoliation which otherwise you may might have missed so gonioscopy is a integral part of the examination for all the patients having a glaucoma or suspected to have a glaucoma so uh, you know we cannot uh, escape from the gonioscopy it is must no, 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 now coming to the plateau iris if you have even, a plateau iris is open. so obviously you 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 differentiate but you have to differentiate between the plateau iris syndrome and the plateau iris configuration usually the plateau iris configuration would do well with just the laser peripheral iridotomy 
but yes in, in my practice i would do the peripheral iridotomy first and then only i would think of the iridoplasty if the patient has not responded well so certain is that the oh uh, yeah it goes well with that uh, whatever he said the other other thing is the uh, some of them have an anterior uh, insertion of the iris with an angle closure appearance but uh, what do we do in that kind of a scenario is that the pa is going to be beneficial in those patients because those kind of patients are mostly we can see in the uh, teenage group or there was a mild increase in intraocular pressure it is not the plateau iris but this is the anterior insertion yeah, of yeah, the iris just the iris is inserted yeah. a little anterior. So I think that also happens. You do UBM, I think the silly body is normal. But yeah. still the angle, angle, you know, there's a bit of a space there. Like you have the swallowers line, you have the, in the skull spur, and in between that's angle, which is like superiorly it would be over a millimeter and all around, say, on average, yeah, millimeter. Yeah, the ACD is, is almost but normal. ACD yeah, is normal. Yeah, but here it is kind of a, is, uh, you know, encroaching the iris. Insertion is very interior. Anterior, it's more anterior iris. Yeah, it's iris. encroaching on the typical meshwork. Yeah, yeah. so... So that, that also appears to be kind of a uh, confusion to the angle closure disease. Yes. Uh, it is kind of an angle closure. Yeah, the, I mean, yeah. it is. Yeah, the <laughs> anterior insertion of the iris, you can, you can call it as a plateau iris configuration, obviously. I mean, the plateau iris basically is you know, used for a very specific yeah. entity yeah, because you, you totally have different processes, uh, yeah. you know, which are, but, you know, which are push pushing anteriorly. So that's kind of a specific phenotype yeah. we use. Generally, we associate with that. Yeah. Okay, so, so in that case, both is that an iridotomy is going to helpful? I, I Probably not. I mean, wh how do you do that? <laughs> how will you manage, you know, that? Situation? Usually we manage it more like an open angle than going in for an angle closure management. Even if you do PA, it is not going to be a change yeah. which is going but to happen do there. Do you think iridoplasty would work there, or gonioplasty? You just push the maybe angle? May, maybe a chance, but uh, I haven't tried a, a gonioplasty for those. The, we usually manage it with more of a medical management then go for yeah. other uh, like uh, surgical procedures in case if it is the IOP is too high. Okay. So and so uncontrolled IOP with the AGM, then we go for the surgical procedure. In this. Uh, so, so what Dr. Satin is saying that there, there will be a subclass, the, the numbers would be small, but they're not rare, they're not rare, they, they do yeah. happen. And where, um, you know, the, the iris is actually flat, there's no iris bombay. So what, what he's trying to say, uh, what I understand is that you look for iris bombay configuration. So if there's an iris bombay, or there's a people relative people block is the mechanism, then I don't mean definitely is the you know the thing to do. But if it's some other mechanism and then I dot me kind of be keep in mind that I dot me may not be the final uh, you know treatment for that patient. And even in other cases I think if you had an I dot me all the cases they do need follow up because late rise in IOP even after I iodotomy does happen as a few years down the line the IOP can still go in spite of the patent iodotomy because there are other factors coming in. Yes? Just wanted to add when we are uh, informing the patient about the iridotomy patient thinks that the glaucoma has been completely treated. So we, we tell them specifically the iodotomy is done to make sure that the acute attacks can be possibly prevented not 100% because there are uh, published articles, even if you have done an iodotomy, open iodotomy also, still these patients can go for an acute angle closure disease. Yeah, usually they are the patient who have a plateau iris syndrome. So they still have a tendency to go for the acute angle closure attack. So obviously these, these are the subgroup or a, co a small cohort of a patient where you need to do the iridoplasty. Uh, but yes, you need to explain to the patient that uh, any patient, whether you are vaccinating the eye against angle closure glaucoma, then also you have to tell to the patient that glaucoma is a lifetime disease and patient always has to be under close follow-up with their glaucomatologist or ophthalmologist. Sir, there is, uh, there is always a gray zone so far as treatment of plateau iris syndrome, uh, what to do, what not, what not to do. So, uh, for the sake of house, uh, what will you suggest, how to start? If I get a case of plateau RS syndrome, I am seeing a significantly high pressure. What should I do first and how uh, should I, I proceed? I think uh, the algorithm that we usually follow is that we do a laser iodotomy for these patients because there may be some element of uh, angle closure, plateau, uh, the, the pupil block. So let's get rid of that and then see the pressures. If the pressure is high, the second step would be to do a laser iodoplasty. Uh, because if you can do that peripheral laser iodoplasty, the iris gets thin, then it's pulled out of the angle, and that 
works better than iodotomy actually and there is this sufficient for most cases for a you know for some time you know and which is could be you know several years and uh, of course monitor these and if the pressure is still high or goes up then you manage them with medical therapy. Yes somehow you know we also do and the And if medical plastic. therapy fails then of course surgery so. Uh, we laser. also do the iridoplasty, but you know what we have found that the single row of uh, laser mark is not sufficient and then you have to put the two rows of the laser mark and usually it works well and that also we have published our data uh, way back in uh, 1998 probably in Indian Journal of Ophthalmology, a small series of 16 patients uh, where the single row was not adequate, then we have put the two rows and uh, these most of these patients they work well but still if it doesn't work well then you don't have any other option except to uh, go for the surgery i think any any problem with iodoplasty i think we don't mind spend time on angle closure because angle closure is the most frequently missed uh, glaucoma and this is half our population's glaucoma primary glaucomas are actually angle closure and this is often missed and angle closure is three times more blinding than POAG. So I think whatever time spent on angle closure is actually is worth, worth the time. Other conditions are uh, not that common, some are rare, we are going to discuss that but we, we need to know them also. So angle closure is really we need to understand uh, this much better. So any, any problem with iodoplasty? I personally don't do much of an iodoplasty. Mostly I end up doing only the PI, then medical management. Okay. Then and then not surgery if required, so yeah. that way. Not okay. much of an iodoplasty. Earlier I used to do, but uh, nowadays I don't do almost. I think the problem, yes, please. Few months, if it is getting closed, when you are doing the peripheral iodotomy, if the opening is too small, and second thing is if the pigmentation is getting blocked, the pigment layer is coming and blocking, then there is always a chance. It is not that there is no chance. But if you have done a decent size, then I think it should be fair enough. We can repeat him. You can always repeat. repeat. There is no problem. Okay. But one thing is, uh, uh, if you feel the same area, again the iris is coming and blocking. I mean, the f strands are there. You can see that if there are multiple strands, again you will go for the blockage only. You identify a other place to do the iodotomy. First choice is always in the same place making it bigger. But if you feel that place is not ideal, then you go for the different place and make the opening much bigger. Can we do with diode laser also? Diode laser? I, I don't think. Diode laser, I, I don't know. Maybe the diode. Di diode laser? Mm. If, uh, diode, I, I don't know. How do you do with the diode the laser? Two the small things, you know, yes, the literature says that the 200 micron iridotomy is sufficient, but always do a little bigger size. In my opinion, 500 micron is a good size for an iridotomy. So always little bigger size. And when you are not able to find a trip, then don't make it an ego issue. And uh, you know, ask the patient to come again after two, three days, repeat it. It, it is very easy to penetrate the iris. Mm -hmm. Yes, if you want to do in a same sitting where the trip is not seen and the peripheral iris is pretty thick, then yes, you can take the help of the green laser. You can do the thinning of the iris stroma and then you can penetrate with the YAG laser. But this, uh, probably most of us are not doing. You know, whenever we are not able to penetrate the iris, we call the patient again after two or three days and what he was telling that we put the patient on a very short time for Pilo on a pilocarpid and uh, then it's, it becomes very easy mm -hmm. to penetrate the iris in mm -hmm. the second stage. Which, which diode laser you are talking about, sir? I am not sure whether we can red do a diode. I'm diode red. Uh, diode red. I'm not but sure. I'm not see, uh, I, I, I don't think that the, the uh, red laser is a good laser for doing the iridotomy. Uh, the green laser is the option. Yeah, yeah. Yag, obviously, I mean, uh, argon you can try, but nothing wrong with the argon, but I'm not sure about the red because it is going to be extremely painful. Okay. Yeah, yes, it, it is no, painful. No, okay, no, so yeah, it will I be extremely so. painful, laser. but the penetration will be more deeper with that. So yeah, yeah. probably, you know, there might be a trauma to the zonules of the lens. So don't, so don't usually use the diode laser. Yeah. Usually the under laser block, like an usually under block, we do the, in the theater, we do the uh, lasers. Okay, the uh, YAG laser, is it uh, must to have laser iridotomy lens also? Or directly we can do? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. It's a good <laughs> question. 
I, I don't use, personally, I don't use the lenses. No. Yeah, even I the, don't use the gonial lenses. Okay. Once you know how to do, and if you have identified the crypts, then it is very easy to do it. Okay, sir. And each machine works in a different yeah, way. Let's move further a little yeah, bit. Sure. I think so we did laser adotomy for this patient. And uh, you can see in the post laser adotomy, it's again important to do gonioscopy to see whether laser adotomy has made any difference or not. And you can see now the angles have opened up a little bit. That's kind of a reassuring that this uh, pressure would be a little better controlled and may need less drugs or may not need any drugs. And uh, now, now the vision is, of course, maintained and the pressure has come down to 14 uh, without any medications. So I think we have already discussed this uh, already. I think all these things have already been discussed. Uh, you know the risk factors for angle closure and all, so I'll not go into that. But do remember the precipitating factors which you might have to caution the patient before you have to laser adopt with like dim, dim, dim illumination, emotional stress, mediatics, and uh, you know, those things. Yeah. Yeah, in the dark, in the dark, yeah, in the dark uh, room, yes. So those things, they have to be, yeah. And uh, one thing you have to remember, like this patient actually had the sort uh, treatment for migraine before she came. So I think, so we uh, keep in mind that some of the, you no, know, all migraine patients, they don't, they don't have angle closure, but some angle closure patients, they do kind of a crossover to neurological side. So this patient had a neurology opinion before actually she came to us, so I just brought in this issue. Let's keep in mind that patient is symptomatic, headaches are very frequent, and, and uh, uh, we should keep that in mind as well. And of course, the diagnosis many times delayed, so that we all, and if you know, this is, I think, urban study, so I'm not going into details. I think we'll go to the next uh, uh, slide. Okay, so we go to the next case. So I have put these cases kind of there in a random order, so I also don't know what the next case is. So it's, it's more fun that way, because then I'll go through the case with you and see what happens. Yeah, so I think uh, we'll do that also. <laughs> We'll go. Okay, so this is a 70 years old, uh, 70 years old female reticular coma clinic as a disc suspect, and the main complaint was a little decline in vision, no pain, uh, and um, known case of hypertension for a couple of years on treatment. And uh, on examination, the vision is uh, a little bit low, uh, 618, uh, with some refractive error, and IOP is uh, without medicine is 20 and 18. Uh, anterior segment is essentially normal. Uh, some cataract which could account for uh, 618 vision. And this is how the disc looks like. So what's your take on this disc? Can you, I, can I, can you have the lights off for a uh, you know, minute, please? All right, so what do you think about this disc? So I, I think the way we look at the optic nerve, the way I look at optic nerve, you know, what is the most important thing when you are examining an optic, optic disc, you know, for glaucoma? What is the most important thing? Sorry? Okay, so I, I yeah, so I think you, you are saying the right thing. Is the neural tissue, right? Is the neural tissue, okay? So what is the neural tissue that we are interested in? What is, what is represents neural tissue in the eye? From our point of view, there are two things. One is the nerve fiber layer. We've got nerve fiber layer, that's neural tissue, which forms the optic nerve, right? So in the optic nerve, there's the neuroretinal rim, you know, where the nerve fibers are actually, you know, the neuroretinal rim is made by the nerve fibers. So nerve fibers and the neuroretinal rim, that's the neural tissue. So when you are looking at the optic disc, essentially what you're doing is you're looking at the neural tissue and you want to know whether the neural tissue is there or it's not there, it's enough or it's not enough, it is properly distributed within the optic nerve or not, and is healthy or not. Essentially, these are the three, four questions that you ask yourself. And then based on that, you'll make up your mind whether this is a normal or it's abnormal. So ask these questions to yourself, and what do you think about this neuroretinal rim here? And uh, use your you know, knowledge like all those signs which are, you know, they're all in the books. Uh, so I'm not going through that. But uh, based on that, you know, is this neural, uh, neural tissue enough, or is there a problem with that? Okay, so um, nerve fiber defect, this picture is not very clear. Actually, there might be. Where, where do you think is the fiber defect? Inferiorly. Okay, what else is there inferiorly? 
Yeah, so I think the, the, if you look at the rim, if you look at this is very bright actually. If you look at the uh, rim, uh, the neural rim, it's, it's a pretty good neural tissue. There's a lot of neural tissue all around. But in this area, there's, you know, appears to be less. And if you go by the distribution like IS, ISNT and other things, uh, you expect a little more neural tissue there. So even if there's a good amount of tissue there, but the distribution seems to be a problem. And also there seems to be a little, this is not a very good picture for nerve fiber layer, but there seems to be a little bit of uh, darkening there, which may be nerve fiber layer or may not be nerve fiber layer. So this, this is you, you're suspecting something. So how will you classify? Now if you say, is this glaucoma or not glaucoma? Because when you are examining a patient for glaucoma, you want to, the, the patient want to know, you know, there's glaucoma or there's no glaucoma. And now, whatever information you have till for, what would you say? Glaucoma or no glaucoma? You know, sometimes you may not be able to say clear cut. And, and, and that's, uh, that's a very common thing. So we have to kind of accept that, that all the time we may not be able to say categorically is glaucoma or not glaucoma. And if that happens, then we assign kind of a probability to this disc. So what, is, what are the chances that disc is absolutely normal? What are the chances that this definitely glaucomatous? And what are the chances that disc is somewhere in between? Because the answer to that question will decide what you do. If you say it's normal, then okay, patient goes home. If you say glaucomatous, patient you know, gets treated. In between, probably gets investigated or gets observed. So this is very important kind of in that sense to classify every disc that you see. So here we would say it is a, is a kind of in between somewhere. So it could be a suspected at this stage that we would call it. This is the other disc. So do you find anything unusual in this disc? Fantastic, fantastic, that's wonderful. I think that's wonderful. You can see this looks otherwise normal, but you can see there's a little bit of, again, there's a problem there. So there's a small, you know, notch thing there, and the rest of the things actually looks pretty good. And how is the nerve fiber? Uh, can you see that? Okay, so neurolateral, neural tissue. So what we are, we are not concerned about other things. I mean, you see, you, you know, we teach you a lot of signs, blood vessel signs, you know, and all those signs. They're all kind of a way to get to the, the key thing. The key thing is the neural tissue. So if you can see a defect in the neural tissue, you know, whatever other signs say, you know where you are. So you can see that there's a problem with the neural tissue in this eye. There's a problem here and you can see the problem is. So, so there's a loss of neural tissue. Now this loss of neural tissue may be because of glaucoma, it may be for other reason that kind of we have to correlate with the clinical pictures, but here it looks like that we have glaucoma here. And that's a visual field. So I think now it all makes sense. It actually goes, correlates with the, what we are seeing. Both eyes, there's a little change. Uh, left eye much more because there's a superior defect. So you get the inferior arcuate uh, scotoma and the other eye was inferior defect, inferior thinning, and you are starting to get a superior arcuate scotoma. So I think that's a left eye is early, and this is kind of moderately to almost advanced glaucoma we have, right? So that kind of correlates with this. And of course, you can do other uh, ancillary tests to uh, prove the point, but clinically, you know where you are, you know. And if you had done clinically other tests, then you interpret other tests in light of what you are seeing clinically and only you, you kind of interpret those. So you have already seen these nerve fibular defects and also. So what will you do? The pressure was actually normal in this eye. Pressure was not high. So what will you do? So before you put, uh, now we, there's, a, there's a enough evidence from clinical examination and also from the investigations that in, you know, the patient has glaucoma. Now you, know, you need to define the, you know, what, what are we going to do with this patient next? So this, is this patient a high pressure glaucoma or a low pressure glaucoma? Because if the IOP is normal, then how do you resolve? Best things to do a diurnal variation. Now, ideally 24 hours, but depending on your circumstances, at least do multiple IOPs at different time intervals, and that will give you some idea. So if the pressure is always recorded high, so you can see the fluctuation is actually quite wide. In the right eye is almost 11 millimeters of mercury, and the left eye is like 8 millimeters of mercury. Generally, it's you know, less than 6 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so again, you have a wide fluctuation, and that 
also is a point uh, you know that suggests that what you are thinking is on the right direction uh, this was day night both day night both this was 24 hours so, but uh, if, if you can't do night measurement then at least do daytime measurement and if you even can't do that then do a few you know call patient a few times because here there's no emergency in treating like angle closure disease so here the pressure is not going to shoot up and you know damage the optic nerve we need to treat this patient but there's no emergency so you can always schedule a couple of visits before you know start treatment so that if you know what is the IOP pattern is before starting the treatment then it's monitoring treatment later on becomes much easier so here the mean IOP is always less than 21 millimeters of mercury even on diurnal testing and angles are open on gonioscopy there's no other reason for you know for optic nerve damage and there's an optic nerve damage so this would be like a typical angle uh, normal tension glaucoma uh, variety so then of course you kind of have to look into the the factors what else you so if you is a normal tension glaucoma so what will you would be your approach now how will you deal with that any patient with a normal tension glaucoma uh, what was the age of this patient? You said uh, 80 years. Yeah. So 70. If the, huh? if the patient is uh, 70 or 80 years old and uh, having a normal tension glaucoma with uh, in one eye there is a minimal damage, in the other eye yes there is a significant damage but uh, still the macula is spared, you don't have to worry much because the normal tension glaucoma most of us are fully aware that it's a very very slow progressive disorder. You don't have to be very very aggressive just try to reduce the intraocular pressure by around 30 percent from the baseline single medication like pg analog is is more than adequate you need to think of doing the investigations only in the younger subject and number two in those patients who are progressing rapidly and you have diagnosed earlier as a normal tension glaucoma these two subgroups require more investigations and thorough examination but Otherwise, the patient who is not progressing very rapidly, 70, 80 years or of old with significant visual field in at least in one eye, I don't think that we need to be worried much. Yeah. So all, all uh, normal tension glaucomas, they do not progress. That's one thing. So half of them may not progress for a long time. And the progression is, again, is not kind of a linear progression. It's more often it's like a step ladder kind of a thing. So but the important thing to keep in mind is that, uh, you know, go into their systemic details is there any hypotension or hypertension many patients they have had nocturnal hypotension do they have sleep apnea they have heavy snorers there will be a little more risk uh, and you've seen a disc hemorrhage you know that will alert you and is there any other vasospasm or you know myopic patients there will be a little higher risk so basically you look at the the profile of the patient now uh, how I mean, is this patient likely to progress more or likely to progress less and then uh, most probably you'll put this patient on some some treatment especially if the IOP is kind of an upper side of the normal range like here's a 20 21 millimeters and there's a wide fluctuation so there's a kind of indication definitely for treatment in this patient and then follow up but don't forget the systemic things in these patients sometimes they may have a carotid artery or something some problem uh, sir normal tensive glove comma also disturb us a lot yes. uh, I just want to quote one example. Uh, I have one patient, uh, uh, 32 years old boy, and uh, he, I investigated everything, even uh, CT brain was normal, carotid Doppler, etc. Everything is normal. The the field is worsening every year, and uh, RNFL is worsening every year. There is no history of any ethambutol or anything which which can be related. Uh, the pressure is around 13, 14 in view of CCT. Everything is all right. Now, if, the, if I see a patient in the year 2015, I see this much of RNFL damage, this much of uh, field, 16 further deterioration, 17 further deterioration. Can it be everything, every, all, everything, all the investigations related, everything is normal, <coughs> then what we should do? We ha I have put on prostaglandin, uh, latinoprostate, etc. But still, I feel that uh, I'm unable to explain why the field is deteriorating. I, I obtained uh, uh, opinion from neuros, neurophysicians also. So, uh, 
one thing which I resolved in this kind of patient that this may be a case of primary optic atrophy. Two or three similar cases I have earlier encountered where you have no reason idiopathic optic atrophy and this may uh, the field etc the atrophic changes are going uh, down and down uh, with the age and I think that's what I was going to actually ask you uh, the, the moment you said this is a 32 years old patient 32 you said yeah, yeah so 32 is not a patient is not an age for normal tension glaucoma or even for a PUAG uh, you can get a juvenile glaucoma at that age but the juvenile glaucoma typically have high pressures and they don't present like a normal tension glaucoma. So there is some, some catch there already which we need to look into it. So what are the, what are the things which can be confused with uh, NTG? So look at that. One, more often this can neurological. So you already investigated for you know, MRI and other things and that's normal. So that's a good thing to do because they may have a pituitary problem or some other problem and you can, they can be confused with the normal tension glaucoma. Other thing I would, keep here would be the what was the um, but the pattern on the OCT wh where was the thinning or what was the uh, pattern on the visual field because that could actually suggest a few things earlier uh, when I first op observed there was yellow areas in clock hours um, early okay uh, uh, let me be more and specific both in both how, eyes it was similar. how is the temporal peplomacal bundle how it, it was not that bad. Okay. But but because but, the, but with the worsening, I feel I. I so that, yeah. see, if you are losing peplomacular bundle, B again, that's not a sign of glaucoma. I mean, it happens late. So if you are getting the temporal field defect or if the temporal thinning in the both eyes, I think you think in terms of neurology, and uh, LHON would be a, a diagnosis to be considered here before you go for you know that. Um, autosomal dominant optic, uh, hereditary optic atrophy, you know, that kind of thing. But I think LHON is not rare and we have seen uh, some patients presenting like this and we investigate them, we send them to neurology and they are levers hereditary optic uh, neuropathy. So I think that would be a, a differential diagnosis in your case which should be looked into. And if that's the case, I think anti glucometer drugs are not really going to, you know, do any benefit. So you are giving them just to keep the pressure on the so lower what, side what, with the what, hope that it will work. But the pathology is somewhere different. Yes, what, what you should do, number one is a good neurological workup. It seems that you have already done that. Good cardiovascular workup, that it seems that you have already done that. B12 deficiency because that is the condition, you know, where the loss of papillomacular bundle occurs and uh, it keeps on progressing. So that you have to rule out. Another thing which you should rule out is the history of steroid in the early age. Because all these GLC-1A expressor patients who have taken lots of steroid in the young age, maybe because of some of the other conditions, have a high intraocular pressure, develop the optic neuropathy, then subsequently the pressure comes down, but still the optic nerve is vulnerable to the smaller pressure as well. And they keep on progressing. So in these kind of patient, you have to bring down the intraocular pressure further lower down, even in single digits sometime. So that you need to rule out. And uh, the labor's optic neuropathy, you know, I don't agree because it, it's not a chronic progressive condition. The once the labor's optic neuropathy is sets in, you have a classical uh, visual field defect related to the labor's optic neuropathy, and then you will not see the progression on the vertical follow-up of these patients. I think, I think they can progress. I mean, they can actually present acutely. They can actually present acutely in the initial phase, and then they can, they can, they can inverse. Yeah. So that's again, there are a few things which need to be kept in mind when you are diagnosing. So uh, the, um, in the NTG, the optic nerve, the neuroretinal rim is obviously thinner. Uh, they tend to get more hemorrhages. Uh, the defects tend to be more localized and more, you know, sharper. And um, the visual fields are more central and more kind of a deeper scotoma are there. So these are the kind of reality, but again, none of them is kind of a very pathognomic that is NTG, but that's the pattern generally we see in uh, this kind of glaucoma. So, of, of, of course, we needed to treat this patient and bring it down the pressure down. If the if the IOP is up in the upper side of the you know uh, the normal uh, 18, 20, 21, uh, you, you feel good. At least you can do something you know more definitely to these specialists bring down the pressure. But if the pressure is already like 13, 14, then you have real trouble. You know what to do these for these patients. 
So the point of concern would be that this is a very ca uh, careful clinical examination, thorough investigations, and you know, do the dynamic variation before uh, you know, put on uh, these drugs. And uh, at that age, and also because of the, the vascular uh, hypothesis, avoid beta blockers for these. And if your the patient is on antihypertensive, so make sure that he doesn't get into hypotension or not getting episodes of hypotension. And uh, do investigate for systemic uh, and uh, risk factor, which could, al could also include, you know, anemia and uh, you know sleep apnea, uh, hypercholesterolemia. I think we all looked into and 24 all, all hours blood pressure monitoring. Yeah, the whole time and see that. You know, so we how actually look, load the need to look into all those on. systemic factors in, in these patients. I think we often forget the hyperlipidemia, and you know, uh, we have found a, uh, uh, some cases who had hyper, uh, you know, cystinuria. They had. They have the cystine, the cystine levels were higher actually, so uh, homocysteinemia. Sorry, so I think so, so. Once in a while, that can also contribute to these. So I think to keep your mind open, basically a number of things. So any any question or comment pertaining to this case, we'll go to the next. What time we are to supposed to finish? In. So we have one more. We'll take one more quickly. Okay, so we'll go to. Let's see what this case is. So this is a 76-year-old Indian male, diminution vision in the right eye for two years, uh, and gradual painless progressive, no history of redness, colors, halos, or anything. Uh, no history of systemic illness, uh, no uh, systemic, no trach. History of FACO, left eye, and uh, with good post-operative visual gain one year back. So one eye has probably cataract, the other eye has FACO, and uh, he was diagnosed with glaucoma elsewhere earlier, and uh, there was a use of anti glaucoma medication was done. Uh, started uh, one week back, and IOP as per record was like uh, 2016 with Trevopros, no family history of glaucoma. And this is how the vision is 612, some cataract there, and 69 in the other eye on Trevopros, pressures are very well controlled. Uh, there's no, I'll show you the pictures. So, anterior segment for regard does show you, you know, the cataract, the pseudophakia in the other eye. Uh, the chamber is uh, good depth. Goniscopy. What does it show? Yeah, you, there's an open angle. There's some some pigmentation here, but otherwise, uh, the angle is the sphere angle. So this is some pigmented type of measure, but otherwise, the angle is open. The inferior looks to be more pigmented, more heavily pigmented angle, but essentially an open angle. And this is the other eye where the angle looks. Uh, Little, yeah, again, less pigmentation, but then open angle. The inferior angle is, of course, more pigmented in this case also. This is the optic nerve. So what do you think about this optic nerve? This is a little large cup, right? And uh, uh, the neurolateral rim is good all around. Uh, There's a bit thinning of the neurolateral rim, but I think otherwise uh, it could be a large physiological cup or it may be glaucomatic concentrating enlargement. It could be either way, but there's no focal defect here. There's no, def you know, nerve fiber defect that you can make out in this picture. Uh, Sometimes when the nerve fiber, you know, the damage is diffused, it's very hard to see nerve fiber defect. They are best seen when the damage is localized. So here there's a concentrating enlargement of the optic nerve, uh, optic, uh, you know, uh, this cup, and uh, there's no, there's no focal signs. So again, this is kind of an in-between uh, category. Uh, you don't see any, uh, any uh, nerve fibrillar defects here. And if you look at magnified image, you, you actually have pretty good nerve fiber. If you delineate the margin of the nerve, uh, it's, it's actually pretty good. You have a enough neuroretinal uh, tissue here. None of this so much of the neuroretinal tissue would be compatible with, you know, almost normal visual field, even if it's glaucoma. So there's no evidence to say actually this patient has glaucoma in this eye. And this is the other eye. The other eye is, is a little pale. The disc is a little pale, I would say, and it's more of a temporal pallor, but the rim is there, the rim is still intact. Now that kind of alerts you to other possibilities. So y you can see the the rim is still good. If you delineate, I have put these dots just to delineate the rim margin, and you, but you can see there's a little pallor on the disc. So based on this, actually, we thought there is something is not right about this patient. So we did the visual fields. So what do you what do you think about this visual field? Glucometers, non glucometers normal, abnormal, normal, abnormal. Who says is normal? Abnormal. So everyone says abnormal. So glaucoma, no glaucoma. Non glaucoma, why do you say that? 
just getting but in that side the left side the there is a vertical involvement fantastic okay so i think th that's very important because this is not a very typical field for uh, glaucoma and if you see this all this is on the temporal side and this is also on the temporal side right so this kind of bitemporal kind of a distribution which is not very clear cut but there is a bitemporal kind of pattern here so we actually went then we did the oct and you can see there's a loss of the temporal fibers again so here the papillomacular bundle is actually getting lost than than the rest of the thing so that that actually means that this is not a glaucoma there is something else is happening here so we went into the details of this patient and you know sometimes patients they uh, you know they have been treated sometime years ago and they have forgotten what what was and or they they think that it's not relevant because an eye problem and something else is not related to eye so when we went into details actually this patient had undergone you know some surgery for pituitary adenoma you know five six years, uh, years ago which you know obviously he didn't not relate to the current problem so and this was the original visual fields that there's a very typical of temporal bitemporal hemianopic pattern and uh, this is post operative and this has actually uh, you know uh, kind of resolved to a larger extent and this is kind of a residual field effect that we are seeing now so uh, this patient basically had a pituitary adenoma neurological which was uh, uh, being treated as glaucoma with trabeprost so now we know now we have gone through all the details now you know that probably this this pallor is not change is not related to glaucoma and you could easily stop this trabeprost and the pressure is still normal so i think that's a that's kind of a lesson is to go into detail uh, into the patients if something doesn't make sense clinically investigate it and the, the solution may come from the patient himself or from some of the investigations and uh, so that would avoid unnecessary therapy so i think we will probably Sir, uh, in stop the, here yeah. i will uh, so far as field is concerned for the sake of house one thing is very important when you are assessing a glaucoma case the horizontal line must be taken care of yes. and anything when you see that it is going uh, i mean vertical then you must always suspect for a uh, neurological case yes. maybe and in same thing happened here in that case you may be seeing that uh, vertical uh, scotomas and in the other eye there was a yep. one quadrant involved so that could lead your uh, diagnosis and you may see that some some, some yep. neurological yep. problems so i think i'll ask this question uh, i ask you a question uh, what are the signs uh, in a glaucoma patient you are you are investigating patient for glaucoma what are the signs which will tell you that oh it's not glaucoma it might be neurological so visual field abnormal atypical visual field you said that's one are there other other indicators pallor of the neural tube rim like we had in this patient so that was the first indicator in fact we saw even and before the visual thing, fields and one thing one thing regarding field when when we have uh, uh, fields like 24-2 or 30-2 then we must and we suspect a case to be a neurological case we must go for the full full field 120 yeah, sure. that will give you uh, an idea that whether we are dealing a case of glaucoma right. or a neurological right. case so two two signs any anything else and any other any answer how is the visual equity so if the visual equity is low the glaucoma you know the visual equity is maintained unless it's a very advanced disease so if the visual equity is affected early again you think of that may not be glaucoma and something else a anything and else and the pupillary reaction rapd but rapd could be there in glaucoma also so again relative but again another one of the signs but sometimes glaucoma patient will also show rap show rapd if you but examine them more carefully advanced glaucoma uh, yes and also if there's a symptomatic you know if there's a something not making is a patient has some symptoms headache or something which is you can't explain on the eye findings and if you have any of these factors i think usually they'll have a more positive scotomas acute onset positive scotomas are more in favor of uh, most neurology. of the neurological diseases there. okay so these are the some of the you know clinical signs even b before you go for any mri or ct i think if you observe these signs and then refer the patient you are on a much full footing that okay you are thinking in the right direction so some patients will have how often do you get the neurological patients in glaucoma how often what is the kind of a ratio the crossover what is the one is it a common problem or rare problem 
in my practice it's, it's so common. quite common no, not it's so common. i see yeah i think it's a common but i think there's some data published i don't remember exactly at least where. five patient in a month yeah. i see so i think the figures are somewhere around eight percent so if you do if you neurologically screen all your patients you know about eight percent then will have some neurological problem not very common and other way around is also true if you all the neurological patient if you if you screen them for glaucoma, then about the same percentage, you know, comes in that way also. So you can say somewhere around eight percent will be the big crossover between. between. So, so I think. Do you have any, any other question? Yeah, the, you know, there is one very important point. You go to the perimetry of that. You know, never ever go by the gray scale. You know, when you see the gray scale, in the first field, before that, in the left eye. You may feel that it, you know, it's, it's quite normal, but go for the with the deviation plot, and with the deviation plot, yes, you get a very good information. So the gray scale is is not a good indicator. So always beware. And I'm not totally convinced with the 120 points. Nowadays we are not doing 120 point full fields. Oh, we, we know, I think patient. most of the most of the neurological defects they will come within 30 30, 30 dash two. two. Most of them. I think we probably have to close with the time is uh, done. So thank you very much for being here. And uh, we had a lot more cases. I, I hope, uh, you know, we had more times we had discussed more. But uh, I think uh, we'll have to stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>